Arthur Beecham was leafing through the butterfly collector when his wife put down her embroidery. What time are the Snapes coming? I'm sorry, dear? The Snapes, Henry and Sally. When are they coming? Well, I'm not sure. Around six-ish, I think. No doubt they'll spend the entire weekend kissing and cuddling and making sheep's eyes at one another. It's positively indecent the way they both carry on. Well, they're just young, dear. Young and in love. That's no excuse. You wouldn't dream of cuddling me in public, would you, Arthur? <clears throat> no, dear. No, of course not. He shuddered slightly at the thought of it. But if you disapprove of them so much, why on earth did you invite them down in the first place? You know why? For bridge. They both play an absolutely first-class game, and for a very decent stake. She fixed him with a stare that could freeze molten lead. I'm sick and tired of having to play with rabbits all the time. Arthur tried retreating back behind his magazine, but he could feel his wife's eyes boring through the pages, so he got up and went to the window. Oh, it's a lovely day, isn't it, Pamela? As he looked out, he wished for a moment that he was one of the butterflies he so much admired. Flitting delicately from flower to flower, happy and peaceful and free from care. Arthur! Uh, yes, dear? Come over here. Ah, well, back to reality. I've just had the most marvellous idea. Do you want to have a little fun tonight? A little fun? Yes, with the Snapes. I've been sitting here thinking about how awful they are. If they can't keep their hands off each other in company, what on earth must they get up to when they're on their own? Well, I'm sure I couldn't say. Well, there's an easy way to find out. We're going to hide a microphone in their room. A microphone? No, Pamela. No, no, you can't mean it. Why not? Oh, because it's nasty. That's why not. Of course it's nasty. So am I. And so are you in your own quiet way. Well, I think that's a little strong, dear. Is it? You read Mary Probert's diary from cover to cover when you found it in her handbag last Christmas. You made me. Oh, that's right. Blame someone else. It's a good thing you are no saint. I couldn't possibly stay married to a man who was nicer than I am. And then where would you be? High and dry, that's where. Pamela had brought all the money to their marriage and she still controlled the lot. You're always tinkering around in the workshop with electrical things. Surely you know how to connect a microphone to a speaker. Well, of course, it's easy. Uh, but I haven't said I'm doing it yet. Don't be so flabby. It's about time we had a little fun and the Snapes will never be any the wiser. I'll have to think it over. There isn't time. They're due here at six. You said so yourself. Go on, Arthur. And you waved him away like a monarch dismissing a flunky. Get to work. The secret of surviving marriage to Pamela, Arthur had discovered, was seeing as little of her as possible. Whilst butterfly collecting kept him out of harm's way most of the time, he liked every now and then to try his hand at something else. And his most recent something else had been ham radio. Now... Where on earth did I store that cabling? After rummaging around in the workshop cupboard for a while, he took out a microphone, a speaker, and 50 yards of wire. As he placed them into a cardboard box, he felt, to his surprise, a little stab of excitement. It was nothing major, of course. Just the sort of tingling sensation I get when I check the value of Pamela's shares. But he had to concede it was there nonetheless. Well, have you finished yet? Arthur was on his knees in the spare bedroom, rolling back the carpet when Pamela came to inspect his work. Almost, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to hide the wire. Where have you put the microphone? Well, inside the sofa opposite the bed. We don't want the snakes stumbling on it by accident, do we? And the speaker? Arthur glanced up at her. She was more than a foot taller than he was, and from his position down by the wainscot, he found her more than usually intimidating. Well, in our room, of course. Why don't you go and try it? Pamela found the speaker standing on her dressing table, looking for all the world like a harmless radio set. She made herself comfortable in front of it, and, as per Arthur's instructions, switched it on. Testing, testing. One, two, three, are you receiving me? Yes, Arthur, loud and clear. She suddenly realised that, although she could hear him, he couldn't hear her. It occurred to her briefly that she ought to go and congratulate him on a job well done, but she wasn't much given to praise, so she decided against it. Pamela, 
Arthur's voice crackled through the speaker again, this time with a slight edge of panic. I think I can hear the Snape's car coming up the drive. I haven't finished secreting the wires yet. You'd better go and distract them. When he'd finished, Arthur tidied himself up and went downstairs to the living room. He found Pamela mixing cocktails. So the invisible man appears at last. <laughs> Aren't you going to apologise to our guests, Arthur? Oh, yes, dear, of course. He turned to the sofa where the Snapes were sitting. I'm very sorry I wasn't here to greet you when you arrived. Oh, don't be silly, Mr Beecham. Sally Snape treated him to a winning little smile. Your wife told us what you've been doing. Arthur felt the blood drain from his face. Surely Pamela hadn't betrayed him for her own cruel amusement. And we want you to know we don't mind in the least, do we, Henry? No, darling, of course not. Mm. In fact, if anything, we both think it sounds rather stimulating. Uh, what sounds rather stimulating? Collecting butterflies, of course. I told the Snapes you were busy sticking pins into red admirals or whatever it is you do. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, thank you, dear. <laughs> Once the drinks had been distributed, they began talking. Henry had his arm around his wife's shoulder, and every now and then he squeezed her and gave her a little kiss. Mm. <laughs> oh, Henry. <laughs> Pamela would normally have pursed her lips and scowled at such unseemly behaviour, but instead she just smiled indulgently and gave her husband a knowing wink. It's quite an unusual name. Snape, yes. Uh, do you know, when I was at school, they all used to call me Scurvix. Can you guess why, Mr Beecham? I'm sorry? Arthur suddenly noticed that Henry had been addressing him. The boys at school, they all called me Skurvix. Can you guess why? Well, I'm sure I couldn't say. Because Curvix is the Latin for nape. S. Curvix. S. Nape. Snape! Snape. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, of course, I see it now. He didn't. Which school were you at, Henry? Eton. Eton? Really? I hadn't realised you were an old Etonian. There's no reason why you should, Mrs Beecham. Oh, please, call me Pamela. Now that Henry had risen in her estimation, Pamela was willing to talk to him. So Arthur turned his attention to Sally. I'm very much looking forward to our game of bridge later tonight. Thank you, so am I. You're both awfully good, you know. What's your secret? Practice. Practice, practice, practice. We play almost every night, don't we, Henry? Yes, darling, and not just at bridge. <laughs> Another hug and a kiss from Henry. Another smile and a wink from Pamela. Have you ever played in any championships? Not yet. Henry wants us to, though. But it's such terribly hard work to reach that standard. A sudden weariness seemed to come over her. Such terribly, terribly hard work. After dinner, they returned to the living room and began their game. Four no trumps. No bid. Five diamonds. No bid. Six hearts. No bid. Perhaps because they had other things on their minds, Pamela and Arthur were both below form, and the Snapes got the better of them time and again. <sighs> One small slam. Bid and made. Game and rubber. <laughs> well done, Henry. You're unstoppable tonight. You've just been lucky, that's all. Oh, nonsense. You both played like experts. Oh, that's kind of you, Arthur, but we made one mistake. You mean when Sally overestimated your hand and bid six spades? Yes, and cost us 800 points into the bargain. I'm sorry, Henry. I should have been paying more attention. You're right. You should. But never mind. He leant across the table and kissed her hand. <laughs> I forgive you. Please. No more post-mortems. I can't abide post-mortems. Pamela was adding up the points. Well, by my reckoning, we owe you £300. We'll uh, settle up in the morning, if that's acceptable. More than. One more rubber before we retire? Not tonight, thank you, Henry. I'm tired out. And so is Arthur. Aren't you, Arthur? Well, as a matter of fact, Aren't you, dear? Arthur? Yes, dear. Completely done in. Pamela showed the Snapes to their room, then, like a well coiffured greyhound, raced back to her own. Well, have they said anything yet? No, dear. I hope that thing is working. Oh, sh shush, dear, listen. Well, that was a bloody awful evening. Henry's voice crackled through the speaker. It sounded harsher than it had downstairs and devoid of affection. What the hell do you think you were playing at? I'm sorry, Henry, I made a mistake. Yes, and lost us 80 quid's worth of points. We came here for one reason and one reason only. To make some money from that stuck-up old cow. Stuck-up old cow? I, I think he means you, dear. 
still got a game every night next week. And if we want to eat, we can't afford any more blunders. So do you know what we're going to do? What? Have another practice. Oh, no, Henry, please, not now. I'm exhausted. Arthur, what on earth's going on? Come and sit down. Arthur put a finger to his lips and nodded at the speaker. I'll call them out. You reply. Henry, please, not all 500. It'll take us forever. Stop whining. We won't bother with the finger positions. You seem to know them. Are you ready? Yes. From the top, then. One club. He put a curious emphasis on the first word, drawing it out slightly. Ace. Queen of clubs. King. Jack of spades. No hearts. An ace. Jack of diamonds. Good. How many cards to each suit? Look at my finger positions. You said we wouldn't bother with those. Well, as long as you're sure. I am, honestly. Okay, then. A club. King. Um, Jack of clubs, ace of spades, queen, jack of hearts, and ace, queen of diamonds. It's a bidding code. No hearts, Some sort of jack of diamonds. bidding code. Jack of spades. A bidding and code? Ace. Yes. No diamonds. From the queen. card he bids. And the way he does it, she King. can work out every other card in Ace. his hand. Mm. It's impossible. Ace. He's an old Etonian. Well, not impossible, uh, dear. Queen. Just very hard to learn. Listen. I'll go one heart. Mm -hmm. uh, King, queen, ten of hearts, ace. Jack of spades, no diamonds, queen, jack sure, of Sure, that's what queen they're of doing. Clubs, well, there's no doubt hearts, about it, I'm afraid. King, and the way he holds ace, his fingers shows her no how many hearts, cards he has in each suit. Arthur shook his ace, head sadly. No diamonds, it's queen, disgraceful. Diamonds, quite, spades, quite disgraceful. Queen. You're right, it is. Ace, disgraceful. Jack of clubs, Dishonest. Ace, and King, absolutely queen, brilliant. Uh, queen, I beg your pardon. Jack Don't you see, Arthur? Hearts, With a system like queen, that, the no sky's hearts, the limit. Quickly, jack fetch me a pen and paper. And I've ace, just had the no most diamonds, marvellous queen, idea. Astonishing. Incredible. You both played like demons. Over the next few months, Pamela and Arthur grew used to hearing such compliments whenever they sat down to bridge. If their opponents ever wondered how their game had improved so remarkably, they never inquired. Nor did they notice how carefully Pamela listened when Arthur started bidding, nor how closely she studied his fingers and the way he held his cards. Mm -hmm.